Okay, I'm recording too. Right, excellent. We're having a a one-off impromptu conversation with my friend Grant Campbell, and this will go out hopefully on YouTube and everything. And this there is a reason behind it. We are part of the Ultimate Raw Vegan bundle, so we do want to talk about that and promote that, and we both support that. Um, but that's not all we're going to talk about. We're certainly not going to talk about that. My intention is not to just talk about that, but We'll talk about that in a little bit, but what I I kind of want to have um, a bit of a different conversation than I sometimes have with, say, the Love Fruit podcast interviews, which is, is uh, more about people's personal stories, their journey, their everything else. And I want to kind of talk to you about where we are in the raw vegan movement right now and what's happened over your experience in, as part of the raw vegan seen and everything and how it's uh grown and how it's developed and how it's changed and the different people that have played a part in that i think that might be an interesting conversation and i, I had this idea of having conversations called saving the raw vegan <laughs> um and then and so angelica is going to join us we've got a little bit of an audience uh we might have a few more people join thanks angelica for joining um feel free so um but how about you just introduce yourself briefly so that if anyone in my audience doesn't know you they can learn a bit more about you yeah i'm grant campbell uh it's always a pleasure to have a chat with ronnie we uh we keep in touch pretty regularly uh, i'm from australia i'm an ultra marathon runner for um for the last 16 years I've been raw vegan for over 15 years. I've uh, been vegan for yeah. over 21 years. Um, yeah, I, I love life. I love, I love, I love everything about life. I just love how things get richer and richer. The more you grow, the more you can grow. Uh, I just love, love the journey. And uh, yeah, I love, just love talking about interesting things. I don't have any taboo topics. Ronnie, Ronnie and I talk about everything. <laughs> no, there's no shame in that. And um, yeah, I just love building courage and. Um, I love being vulnerable in a safe space. And yeah. yeah. So this conversation, just to let everyone know, well, I just want to say this briefly, but we're going to keep on going. But this whole conversation, this video is sponsored by the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle. If you want to find out more about that, um, you can go to Grant's profile on Instagram, Raw Aussie Athlete, or myself as well, and you can find our links to that. Uh, or you can contact us or whatever. And... Um, you'll find more information about that. Fruitfest.co.uk slash bundle is one place to go and get it. Grant, how would they find it through yourself? Just through? Yeah, on my Instagram channel, it's in the, it's in the bio, but it's just uh, bit.ly bit slash raw Aussie athlete bundle. But yeah. we, it has to have capitals in capital R, capital A, capital yeah. A, capital B. Is it raw Aussie, raw Aussie athlete, athlete on Instagram for people that want to follow you? Yeah, at raw Aussie athlete on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I have this idea of talking about saving the raw vegan movement and uh, I, I don't necessarily think it needs to be said. I kind of feel like, I don't know what you feel like, but I sort of feel like there's a bit of a start of a, hopefully the start of a bit of a wave happening with this bundle with other things. It feels like people are starting to work together, getting this message out. There's more and more people that are picking up on this message and sharing it with people in different ways. And... Um, but let's go back to see when you started off doing this, I'm guessing it was maybe around the time just before the 801010 book. 2000, 2005, yeah. one and year I, before 801010. And my personally, like, if I think about, say, this bundle that we're doing, I don't think that that happens without Doug Graham and the 801010 book, or it wouldn't happen in the way it is happening. That's really the first book in the entire raw food canon of books. I mean, a lot of them said fruit, a lot of them said raw food, but to me, that book actually gave a plan for people. It wasn't just a kind of philosophy of eating fruit. It was like, no, you can actually do this. <laughs> Here's how to do it. And then people started to actually do it in large numbers. And it, it kind of caught on very quickly. Lots of personalities start to go out there. This rarely happens. I rarely ever see this happen in anything where someone publishes a book and just literally sort of, word of mouth, reputation, people trying it out and then sharing the message, it just started to get out there and get out there. And 
and and and and in my impression of it was that was really growing and then it kind of I don't want to say it, it didn't drop off but the momentum kind of maybe stopped a little bit at that point and and at that point everything was 80 10 10 and now it sort of feels like it's moved away from that a little bit but what's your kind of perspective on all that situation yeah i i agree in in principle with, with what you're saying um i i do think <clears throat> there's a lot of credit to be given to people before doug because you know doug didn't really invent anything he just pulled it all together and, and i really feel like he did he not only pulled together but he made it um he put it he, he wrote a book that that made it um, practical so you could apply it to yeah. your life. Like I read a book by, called Raw Energy by Leslie Kenton was the first book I read um, about raw. And that was while I was cooked vegan. And it didn't, it didn't make me go raw at all because it wasn't practical. It didn't, it had recipes like Essene bread that took like three days to make. And it just, it, it planted seeds about why raw was better and about how cooking damaged things and things like that. But it, it didn't say how to do it. You know, eating whole fresh, ripe, raw, organic, plants one food at a time when hungry till full <laughs> all this eating in simplicity all these things but, but that's the thing it's kind of easy for us now to say well doug just pulled some ideas together and all. it's easy to look back but no one else had done it and it's actually very hard to take a bunch of ideas and bring it together like that that is in itself an incredible yeah, doug, doug, doug is uh doug is a special special guy for sure um like he got from his father the ability to read a lot of books i think I don't think I've ever known anyone um, that read more books than Doug's dad did. Like he would literally borrow 20 library books and bring them back two days later. Like it, it, it was just unbelievable. He, he read fast and he, he was just read prolifically and on all topics. And Doug, Doug got that, um, that from his dad and, uh, and Doug, when Doug got into natural hygiene and, and nature cure and all the, all the natural kind of health information. He read every, he read hundreds of books. He read everything that was available, all the literature from a hundred years ago, you know, Bernard McFadden and his encyclopedia of health. Like Doug's the only person other than myself that I, that I know has a copy of that even. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, um, you know, just all the history, Ellen White and all the, all just, um, you know, Hilton Hatima or whatever, I don't know, there's always people that just all contributed things in different ways that all contributed um, to, the, to the overall message. And, um, and Doug released this book called, you know, the 80, 10, 10 diet, which was, was the year after I went raw, but, but I, I still went raw because of Doug's information after hearing the perfect health program, the, the 12 hour audio program that Doug, um, cause you got to understand Doug was teaching the 80, 10, 10 diet just by, just not by that name for like, you know, the 20 or 20 to 25 years or whatever before that. Yeah. Um, so you know, his message almost didn't change at all. I think he used to, before he started using the term 80, 10, 10, he used to, I remember some really super old recordings where he, he talked about, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was like 78, you know, <laughs> 10, 12 or something like it was, it were 82, nine, nine or, sure, or whatever. Sure. Like it was just, it was just more like, you know, and then obviously 80, 10, 10 is easier for people to, to use in practice. So he went with that, but, um, but certainly back, uh, you know, like the turn of the, um, like the turn of the 19th century, like back in like you know, the 1900s, early 1900s, the, um, they, uh, there was a, a huge movement. I, I'm told there were like literally in like, I think the, the, the California kind of area, I don't know which parts of California specifically, but I think pretty much lots of like, you know, the San Francisco and, and LA and stuff. There was, there was literally thousands, like I, I think the number that comes to mind is like there was a gathering of like 5,000 people that were all into eating fruit. Like, yeah, they weren't 100%, they weren't 100% raw, they weren't 100% yeah. vegan, like, like Doug, like Doug definitely um, helped bring that to, to people, but, um, sorry, just making sure my power doesn't run out. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and, uh, and, but then the germ theory kind of came out and um, crushed all of that and everyone started cooking everything and became scared of, um, of germs. I'm not sure that my, my power is charging properly. I might just move sure. to the other side of the room quickly. No problem. Nice paintings. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a history um, change of scenery. Um, <laughs> 
so there's a history um, there that you know you can't dismiss that. And um, but yeah, certainly Doug read hundreds of books, and and he the way he learns, he you know he takes the key principles from from books and um, and seems to and just to, just um, seems to pull it all together into a cohesive um, combination of science and common sense, and uh, and that's what gave us a, the practical kind of approach to it that so many of us have followed and found it easy to follow, um, certainly easier than it ever was before. That previously, yeah, all the natural hygienists, they you know, from 100, 100 plus years ago, they all would, um, you know, they would all either have goat's milk or um, um, so that it wouldn't be vegan Greens, or they would, greens, or they would have, yeah. yeah, or they would say like raw is, is the best but only if you have up to 80% raw, like you've got to have at least 20% cooked, otherwise you get imbalanced, things like that. Yeah, because... so, so Robert Morse, I saw there's a, an interview with him with Ted Carr from a couple of years ago, and he goes, um, yeah, the ideal is fruit. However, we moved out of our tropical environment. We moved north to a more, I don't know if he said more acidic climate or something. So we need the, I, I don't know what he said. We moved to a more alkali climate. So we needed, to balance out with more acidic foods or something so it's very hard to stay raw but it's just like people would say these things just because they didn't really know how to do the diet as far as yeah. i can see like they just they were just clearly i think the mistake everyone makes is not eating enough food right and everyone veers towards almost like how little can i eat you know <laughs> like for yeah uh, well, i mean it's a dream isn't it that's that that the the alluring aspect like in people you know, we've had talks about it on Fruity Fridays, the, the breatharianism kind of approach. People just, they they just get so disillusioned with eating and having digestive problems. And when they stop eating, like their digestive problems temporarily go away, their discomfort temporarily, temporarily goes away. But, and then the danger is when they start thinking that that is actually a sustainable lifestyle, which it certainly isn't from any evidence I've ever seen. <laughs> And everyone that I've known that's ever claimed to be breatharian, you know, is is it's been a fraud, or they, or they maybe they believe it themselves to some degree, but it's it's not. You know, it, it's I've never seen it demonstrated. Yeah, and it's frustrating because people that are quite new into this movement will will say to you, "Well, Grant, you just don't know what you're talking about. Like you've never you've never experienced it. You've never tried to be a breatharian yourself, so you don't know. You don't know my truth, you know." And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not enlightened. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's not, it's uh, not good. I mean, I've, I've run till I've fallen asleep. I've, 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 I've hit the wall. I've run out of carbs. I've fought water fasted for 29 days. I, I have a fair idea, you know, I've explored these, these avenues um, and studied enough, um, you know, science and nutrition and hopefully have enough common sense to pull it all together um, to realize that yeah. it just doesn't work that way. There's no, I mean, yeah, some animals can hibernate that's pretty cool that they can do that for six months or whatever. And, and some, you know, some eggs of fish can like live under the ground for like under a dry you know, riverbed for, for years and then suddenly just hatch, which is phenomenal. So it's not like it's, um, it's not in the realms of impossibility as far as like what's physically possible, but I just, I've just never seen it. I've never seen any, any uh, proof or evidence um, Everything I've looked into has always turns out to be not true. Yeah. yeah, and I've I've got a background in and you know, when people talk about chi and energy and I've been interested in that topic since I was like seventeen or eighteen or whatever, and I've been doing martial arts specifically with an interest in that idea and, and I've met people that can do really interesting things and healers and martial arts and stuff that, that seem to be able to exhibit these phenomenon of chi or whatever you want to call it and can cultivate that energy and none of them were not eating none of them were were right. like converting it into food or anything like that and actually a lot of them uh have had varying levels of health you know it's, it's not you can't just build your chi and have a bad diet and it, you know it, that to me that's not going to work and it doesn't make sense like mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't make sense to do that anyway. So, but yeah, um, and I love food anyway. So why would it, what, what's I, the incentive in giving up? That's that's the thing. <laughs> one as well, of my favorite that, parts of the day. Yeah, that's the thing as well. It's like it's enjoyable, and it's it's very strange that people yeah. are, are so determined. I, I think that people 
do the fasting and stuff like that and they have periods or moments of real clarity energy vibrancy especially when you're starting off if you are going from a standard diet and you do a fast one or two days you feel amazing like you can really feel amazing like on a fast um yeah but why people connect that with you know not eating rather than well you weren't eating the bad stuff i don't know but um but yes saving no, the, like people have short memories you <laughs> talk the topic topic tonight saving the raw vegan moment so um do you have any insight i don't know if you were around when the book got published like the 81010 book but i know uh, that, that that book was extremely successful from the get-go and even like someone was telling me jonas Jonas Sunshine, I was interviewing him and he said he got it from Matt Mon. Listen to this story, right? He said he went to a potluck and a guy was telling him about 801010. So he went home, Googled it, and he found it on Matt Monarch's website. He ordered the book from Matt Monarch's website and he got the book and it literally came to him with a letter inside saying, don't do what this book tells you to do. <laughs> you know, funny amazing? story, um, when I first met Doug Graham, which was two years after I went raw, um, was when he came to Australia in November 2007. And um, yeah, and and I ended up driving Matt Monarch um, and, and his wife to um, up north from where I lived on the central coast of New South Wales, Australia, up to Byron Bay, where, where Doug was giving the talks with, with his with Rosie, his wife. and. Um, yeah, so I had Matt Monarch in my car for six hours that day. And uh, and he said, hey, Grant, while I'm with you, I'm going to try the 80-10-10 diet because, you, you know, you know how to do it. So, like, I'll try it. And uh, and so he had what he thought was 80-10-10 for breakfast. He ate some fruit, but but then he poured, like, so many hemp seeds all over the, like, the melon or what I think it was. <laughs> and so it became a high-fat meal. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't criticize him. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, he's given it a genuine attempt. I, I'll just acknowledge, oh, that's cool. It's great you ate all that fruit. Like, that's awesome. Let's, um, let's, let's have some sort of sweet fruit for lunch or whatever. But he, and then his lunch was, um, was became, I'm detoxing too much. Um, this isn't working for me. Obviously, you know, I, I'm just going to go back and eat my own way because this obviously doesn't work for me. And, and he, gave, he literally gave up on it after about three or four hours. <laughs> So, yeah and then he and then it becomes a story like i tried it and it didn't work and it's just it's like he didn't try it he never did it yeah um but it's funny that the book was so selling so well that it was even on his website you know even sure. people that didn't support it and um I, I i wonder like you know doug's never been that active in social media he does have stuff on social media he does have the YouTube channel, but he does very little with it. And I think he mostly is active on his own personal forum. But I was thinking like prior to social media, he mastered kind of the way that people were traditionally getting the word out about things, which is public speaking and going to groups and events. And, and he became a really fantastic speaker. And for some reason, he's never really converted that into getting on social media more like he's i don't know if he if he's never understood it or because there was a point where he was really getting a lot of views and stuff and people would have loved to have heard more from him um what do you think was going yeah. on there yeah i mean doug doug is a, a, a doug is in his element when he's um like i saw him give i i toured with him like i I, I helped him on while he was on tour giving lectures. I wasn't giving lectures. Although he did put me on the spot a few times and said, okay, Grant, you're introducing me now. And I just had to stand up and introduce him with no preparation. And I, <laughs> that was part of his training for me. <laughs> but um, but uh, he, he, he used to, yeah, he used to give like 300 lectures a year and, and things like that and just travel constantly around the US and just, you know, I would, I would be driving him from state to state um, during the period that I was um, helping him tour. And uh, he gave 13 lectures in a row. Uh, again, he, this is while he was training me in, you know, in kind of lifestyle coaching and health knowledge and stuff. And uh, in those 13 nights, he told, he told me and the other guy that was studying with him, um, Simon Flack, to, uh, 
to pay attention over the next 13 nights, he said, I'm going to give exactly the same information, same talk, same information, but a completely different way every night. And there was one night where he had flip charts and had prepared flip charts and he just went, just flip from chart to chart and talked through those. It was, but my favorite was when, um, was when he took all the questions up front. He said, okay, today I'm, I'm taking all the questions up front. Keep asking questions till you've got no more questions. I'm going to put them all on the board and then there'll be no more questions. And then I'll give the, the lecture and answer all those questions. So he wrote up like 50 questions on the board and, and ones that were similar, he, he linked them together as sub points under the, he had all this huge thing on this huge blackboard. And, um, and then he went through and gave the same lecture with the same information, just in a different order. And so it's like he has this, he had this bag of tricks. He gave, he was teaching for so long that he just had this bag of tricks that could answer um, any question on any health topic the simple common sense kind of answer. If someone wanted to go a bit deeper into science, he could, but but he didn't really even need to do that because for a lot of people, just a common sense answer is enough. Yeah. And uh, you know, like and so like any question about iron, any mineral, he would just you know would go back to vegetables in some way, and then yada 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 on and on and on, on through the through the list. And um, it was it was just it was amazing. He just really owned that, and he could give those presentations. And so why hasn't that converted? Um, he's certainly made a lot of videos. I feel like um, probably like my observation would be that in a lot of his videos, and I think he is getting better at it now uh, because I've seen some recent uh, pr presentations of his, especially on the Let's Cook Raw, Let's, Let's Cook Raw show. He's more, the problem is when he speaks to an audience from the stage, he's speaking to an audience, right? And, he, and he, he's, he's great at that, like he owns that. He's just like looking in everyone's eyes, he's connecting with everybody, but it's a group of people. And the big gestures and the big stuff works really well from that sort of stage. But when you're speaking on to, um, you know, on a YouTube video, there's an individual watching it and you're speaking to them, you're not speaking to a group, the big gestures become like egotistical or arrogant or people interpret in all sorts of ways. It doesn't really carry across yeah, you know, this big booming voice and blah, 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 dramatic yeah. kind of yeah. stuff. It doesn't yeah. really, it, it's too much because that's not the same. Um, you know, you don't speak like that when you're having a conversation with one person. And so um, I, th I feel like that's just the, that's the thing that he had to, that he's had to work on. And I gave him that feedback. I don't know if, you know, that's just my yeah. insight. I don't know if it's the thing or not, but. But I just, I just think like, even, even if he did it, even if he was doing it the wrong way, so to speak, it would still be better than doing nothing. And I just feel like he's just kind of done that. Like, well, and I don't it's not that he's done nothing. It's, it's just that it, he, he doesn't want to he do it. He doesn't, he doesn't understand. I don't think he's understood how to use social media. And I mean, he would have learned a ton by being part of this bundle and, and being, um, and just having like Melissa, um, Melissa Maris, raw food romance, like who's her and Chris Kendall have kind of, instrumented this whole bundle the ultimate raw vegan bundle like you know they're giving us great tips about how to market sure. and how to promote things and what's effective and what's not effective from her own personal experience and from a lot of research and um so you know doug doug needs to leverage that information from somebody because he's not just going to learn it from being at home yeah, yeah i um i i i don't know if it's also that he maybe doesn't have to like he's got that's the way i see it as well he's got this like complacent I iconic book and he he still gets plenty of people i think in touch with him and he's got such a reputation that he probably doesn't feel he really needs to do that and maybe he likes yeah. being a bit more private and things um but what i would say is something i've always I felt about doug is he and i've said this a lot and i don't know if it's really true my perception is he's so used to being or he was so used to being the outcast and the kind of the one sensible person in the room of the raw vegan movement when everyone else was kind of uh, saying all this wild stuff and, and selling all these products that sounded great and, and saying all sorts of information that wasn't based on any kind of science or evidence or, or chemistry or whatever and nutrition. And he kind of came along and just said things that made says a lot of people and, and in debates when he was on stage in these debates and, and, and even now to this day if there's a panel of people and Doug's on the panel and you're talking about raw food and 
in the body and stuff, it almost inevitably starts to go, what does Doug have to say about this? You know, everyone has their piece, but then <laughs> what does Doug have to say? Because he usually goes into it in a bit more depth and adds a bit more to it. And it immediately it feels like the audience kind of goes towards that guy knows who he's talking about, right? And uh, sure. and yeah, and I, I but I, I get the feeling that like when Woodstock happened, for example, when the 801010 movement started to grow. I don't know if he was ready for what's the next step for him, you know, like from being that person and speaking and, and being part of the event to being almost like the main focal point, almost the person everyone was looking up to and was expecting so much from. And people were expecting almost superhuman, uh, this superhuman guy in a way, like on all levels. Yeah. And he, and he pretty much delivered on that, to be honest, like, you know, like, he was pretty close to that <laughs> in many ways. Um, well, th there's definitely people that would say that they, like, say Woodstock and a bunch of other things, like, they saw sides of his character they didn't like, because he can be, I don't know so much how much I've seen it in the last few years, but there was, he could, he could sometimes get a bit short-tempered. Yeah, you know, that, he I, could I be, feel like that's, um, I feel like that's, essentially something from the past like I feel I feel like you know like all of us he's continued to grow um he certainly focused a lot on emotional hygiene you know over the decades and um and benefited from that himself for sure he, and he's never he's never above you know change and, and and improving himself he's always looking to do those things so I don't think you'll really see that behavior anymore like yeah but I know I know a bunch of people that like turned off him because of even just the way he answered a question or something like he yeah I know. dismissed I saw it. someone or and, you know. and i feel like most of those like most like at least a lot of that was um people misinterpreting where he was coming from and not understanding him but yeah there was definitely something to it um from his you know he could have done a lot better like i feel like he didn't understand he didn't, I don't think he recognized when people were triggered or misunderstood him. Like, so he didn't get to resolve the issues like before they became, you know, before someone starts, goes away unhappy about something and starts complaining. Um, and then it comes back, you know, in, yeah, in I, ugly I, ways I, when people spend yeah. time in their heads thinking about things. Yeah, I had a few moments where I remember trying to ask him a question because when I was, I was really interested in him and what he was doing and, and, what he was saying and wanted to learn more from but it was very difficult to get in a conversation with him at those events early on because there's a lot of people wanting to speak to him and he had a lot of friends sure. there yeah. so he was constantly with people and constantly with groups of people and stuff and um i remember uh, chatting to him about something and he took it completely the wrong way <laughs> because i was trying to say something supportive or something or something like uh, you know and he took it like i was Saying, saying something against the raw vegan diet and, and kind of dismissed me and walk, walked away. And I just thought, what was that? Like, <laughs> and you're certain that that's, what he, that's how he felt. Well, I'll um, tell you exactly what it was. It was, I was asking him about the idea that Herbert Shelton got Parkinson's disease. And, and I, was, I don't know what I said about that, but I was, I was saying, you know, people don't realize that i don't know i don't know what i was saying exactly but he took it as if i was trying to attack the like natural hygiene oh. yeah and trying to say well and 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 uh but he kind of um i think he said something about like he got kicked in the head by a horse but, but people think it's the diet or something like that. And then he walked away, right? As if like these, these, these idiots think that, that don't realize this guy, you know, got yeah. in the head by a horse or whatever. Right. And, sure. you know, it was, it was just a weird moment where I was like, he's like, you know, you know, what I would say to that is that, um, which I think is a beautiful thing, um, being sensitive, but like, you know, I think he's a very sensitive person and, um, you know, I guess sometimes that can come across as a bit of a fault if you're a little bit too sensitive to something that maybe like overreact a little bit to something. But 
Yeah, he's a very sensitive man for sure. And uh, do you that's, think that's you, there's a lot of there's a lot of strengths to that? So my my idea though of like, I don't think anyone could be prepared for all of a sudden there's an event where they're expecting you to be the guru, right? Uh, but do you get a feeling like he wasn't comfortable with that, or like he wasn't ready for it, or he didn't take advantage of it fully, anything like that? I think I think he did what he knew how to do. Um, you know, like marketing for him was always uh, something that was an effort. Like he 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 would happily give a presentation for five hours and not market anything. Like he would he would he loved to do that. <laughs> Just let the stuff sell itself. Um, but then you know then he started getting people helping him, and then they they'd start pressuring him. Hey, make sure you plug this thing. Make sure you say this, and make sure. And he would find ways to put it in, but when when stuff like that is forced, you know, it, it, it comes across as unauthentic. And because, you know, you, people can see you're uncomfortable. So it comes across as being ingenuine. Yeah. And, um, and it's not that he was being ingenuine. He just, you know, it's just, it's just awkward. If you, if someone, someone tells you, you've got to sell a vacuum cleaner before the end of today, Ronnie, like you probably wouldn't be super comfortable about that. Like, <laughs> you know, um, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a challenge of something maybe you're not used to. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So I feel like it was kind of like that. And um, yeah, I just, and he was used to just kind of selling things in the back of the room. And, and then and then all the stuff changed with social media and the way you market things. And, and his, his formulas for stuff didn't work, you know, the same anymore. And like he used to sell all these books just by touring and, and his books would sell by word of mouth. Like he would just tour around everyone, knew him all over the States. And, uh, and then, of course, it spreads internationally from that. And when you're giving 300 lecture, lectures every year for, for 10 years, like, it's, <laughs> people remember that. Even 20 years later, people still remember. They're like, sure. oh, I saw you play. I saw you speak in Chicago. I saw you speak yeah. in yeah. Las Vegas. I saw you. It happens all the time. And, and when I was at those um, events, you know, helping, it, helping him uh, to give his lecture to a it was amazing. The people that would come up to him and just introduce themselves. Some, there was one guy that brought figs from a hundred year old fig tree and said, I brought these specially for you. They're the only ones from this year's harvest or whatever. Like, and then, and it's just like, you know, people, people would do anything for him because like he literally given them back their life, given them back their health through his information. And, uh, how big I mean, it's, the, really, it's really what, special. What were the venues like? What were the audience sizes and who was organizing these events and stuff? Um, that varied a lot. Um, there was one tour I went on where Robbie Barbaro from Mastering Diabetes um, actually organised the tour because um, he studied event management in uh, in higher education. So, um, and that was that was okay. You know, there was there was a few shortcomings in the in the plan, but <laughs> it worked pretty well. But we would basically like yeah drive. Um, like we, we did a tour kind of all around the north northwest of the US and uh, and, and when it crossed into um, Canada into you know, Qualicum Beach and Victoria BC and um, yeah we'd, we'd just like he'd give a talk in the usually in the evening um, sometimes in the afternoon but usually in the evening and then and then of course everyone wants to talk to him for like several hours afterwards and uh, so we would get to bed quite late and and then just as soon as we and then we get like six hours sleep and then wake up and drive for 10 hours, you know, to the next state. And, um, and, and, and great, you know, great road trip stories of like, you know, buying corn on the side of the road that's just mouthwatering and getting like apple cider vinegar fresh, like I'm not apple cider vinegar, apple, what do you call it? Apple cider, apple cider just the juice, yeah. the fresh juice um, that I'd never had in Australia. It's phenomenal. Like um, nothing fermented about it. Like it's just, it's just, delicious um i don't know just cool things getting fresh wool fresh um like raw almonds at a, at a time when they were making everybody cook their almonds and we just stop at this roadside stall and get truly raw ones that just just got harvested so things like that pretty cool stories um was it, but the, was it, was it like the audience sizes were like ranged from maybe 50 to Oh, like maybe like a hundred to I don't think there was ever more than two hundred people, but maybe like one hundred and fifty people in some audiences. Maybe two hundred. Two hundred probably was the biggest. Yeah. Maybe in Victoria there was I think there was two hundred people. I think we sold a case 
um, of AD1010, the AD1010 diet in like five minutes. People were just literally in the break, in the intermission, like halfway through Doug's talk, they all came over to buy and it was just a frenzy. I've never, I've never been in that situation before. And there was two of us selling things and we're just like, okay, everyone with cards, go to the back, everyone with cash, just like take the cash, get them out of the way first. And like, it was just, it was insane. There was like literally like 50 people waiting to buy a copy of the book and they all wanted to buy it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and so we like sold, yeah, like literally a case in five minutes. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, and so it was exciting times and, uh, yeah, the audience, like, and the people met all kinds of people there. And lots of people came up and shared stories, personal stories, um, you know, horror stories of, of like, you know, why not to follow some of the other fasting supervisors because <laughs> was, I won't mention any names, but, you know, like were, people would share personal stories about things. And, and I started realizing, wow, like <laughs> a lot of these things that Doug's been telling me um, just uh, personally, that like just, um, you know, like things that I don't make public, there's a lot of truth behind them because I was hearing people tell, share their personal genuine story and yeah. you could tell the emotion behind it. And they like, yeah, it was amazing. And there was one girl that like, got lost in Canada in the, in the forest for like nine days and they found her and she was like, that was when she was like 14 years old and they found her still alive. And, and like, and then she came back from that and got into, and then got into 80, 10, 10 and got back into health it was just like <laughs> what a story like yeah so it was, it was amazing times met so many amazing people that are occasionally I, you know those people send me a message or bump into me and say oh, i remember the raw spirit festival <laughs> or whatever back in 2008 2009 um yeah so it's a small world but it's the, the movement's come a long way um it definitely um you know, it went through some challenging times in 2014 at the Woodstock Fruit Festival. Um, like, it, basically, like, there was the stuff, like, in, you know, the 1900s, early 1900s and late, 80, late 1800s where fruit was, like, going through the roof and there was huge movements. And then, then germ theory killed that. Everyone got worried, started canning their food, cooking their food. But then, like, you know, then a lot of other information kind of came out over the years. But then, yeah, the 801010 diet came out, popularised eating fruit-based raw vegan rather than the previous um, type of raw veganism, which was the gourmet, high fat, bad food combination, like nuts and seeds combined with dates, trying to make all sorts of pastries and cakes and stuff that doesn't digest well. Um, and, you know, people tried that raw veganism for a long time and just kept getting sick and feeling terrible. So yeah, Doug popularized fruit-based raw veganism, which, um, which, you know, as we know, works really well. At that and point, then, when, yeah. when, when Doug was doing that tour, was was like durian rider online was freely where christina with all these other people had they started getting going yet with promoting the diet or yeah um they you know doug, uh durian rider had been to doug's costa rica retreats in i believe 2006 2007 um yeah, Harley uh, interned at Doug's fasting event and um, learned a lot there. This was before 30 bananas a day, well well before 30 bananas a day. Um, right, yeah. so they, they were... Christina was at Doug's events before yeah. I was. She, 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 you know, fully raw Christina. She, um, yeah, I, I went to, I was at, she was at many of Doug's events that I was at um, in the first few years that I was at the... At, you know, like I've been at Doug's events, most of almost all of Doug's events for the last 10, 11 years. But in the first few years of that, Christina was at quite a few of those events and, and she had been for a few years prior to that. So, um, yeah, so what's your question mainly like about why were they, were they in the movement or not? Yeah, no, I guess my question was the audiences he was getting, was that, do you think that was anything to do with, was there already a movement online that was, that was part of? Oh, okay. So Doug, Doug had the veg source, um, uh, what do you call it, bulletin board, <laughs> like a, a, a chat chat group yeah. kind of thing, um, where, you know, and, and, and that, that chat group, which, which was run on the veg source forum as a, as a sub, a sub group on the veg source forum, that group pretty much was where Doug, it's similar to his forum that Doug runs now. Um, 
which um, yeah, and it. Uh, I mean, basically, people Doug would always kind of direct people to that, and and then that, and there's so many um, long-term raw vegans on there, you know, like Laurie Ellicott or pe like just people, Laurie Masters or whatever, that would share um, all their stories and and engage and answer questions and all that sort of stuff all the time. So it was a very active forum, and it was a great place to just search and find out any any answers to anything. Um, and 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 really, that's Doug used to fill a lot of his events. I think from from that from the traffic yeah. there like that that was a great because all the people there were just totally committed to the lifestyle and and so like they they would of course they want to be at the retreats like it, you didn't there was no selling required you know like they'd, they'd just be like when's the next retreat i want to come um but then uh then durian writer you know in his uh vengeance <laughs> being uh, sort of bitter and sore about getting uh, depioned yeah. from the Woodstock Fruit Festival, he 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 somehow managed to get on side with um, Jeff Nelson and that's right, yeah, and uh, and took over that forum. And then prior to taking it over, he he would just send all sorts of spam and trash people in there to go to um to just put garbage in the forum to dilute its value. Um, thought, but then he yeah. took it over, and then it just became garbage, and now it's nothing. I thought, yeah, I thought it was crazy that when that was all happening, firstly, um, I guess for people watching, so it was a bit of a bit of a scandal or a drama. We'll go again to that in a bit, but various people who up to that up to that point, Doug was supported by so many people. And as kind of happens when the tide turns against someone, which often happens. Uh, inevitably when someone rises kind of high all sorts of people all of a sudden want to pull out and pretend that they were never involved with them and I think yeah. Harley acted poorly but Jeff Nelson to me I mean Harley was a bit of a rebel a younger guy he had a, he, he was kind of acting in line with his persona you can say all that you can say all these things but Jeff Nelson like this is a guy that's quite an accomplished guy. Like has had the website and all the stuff he did before that. Came out with these child childish videos where he was trying to say like, I had no idea who this guy was. You're like, you the guy was on your on your website for like a decade or something. You never had a clue who he was. You never spoke to him. You yeah. never. No, it's like Jeff. Jeff. Jeff was blatantly dishonest. Um, as was Harley. Durian writer, you know, they lied, they they were deceptive, they manipulated, they they released things, you know, they went beyond clickbait, like, but they but they definitely used clickbait to, you know, dramatic titles and lies to um to get views. And you know, if if you can't win an argument, and they neither of them had any 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 true ground to um to discredit Doug on. So yeah. what do you do if you can't win an argument? Attack somebody's character. It's the easiest way in the world to bring somebody down, and that's what they both did. Uh, yeah, and, and again before that, so to me, like there was a mo there was a point there where it felt like, and it, probably from outside it wasn't, but it felt like to me that the 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 eight ten ten movement was just growing and growing and growing, and it looked like there was nothing holding that back, and then uh, centered around Woodstock, the Woodstock Fruit Festival, a lot of people fell out things fell apart. Some people went back to eating cooked food. And to be fair, the people that went back to eating cooked food, Harley and Freely, were the most militant anti-cooked food people at one point, in my mm -hmm. mind. In my, and their <laughs> website was so strict that they would just be throwing people off left, right and centre for verging anywhere away from, you know, the, the pure diet. And but I feel like, you know, in defense, like, I feel like Freely, um, you know, Freely just was suffering from being with Harley all the time. Like now that she's with another guy, that's a nice guy. She's living, you know, in, in, in nature and, um, you know, she's all raw again now. I think she still, you know, has some cooked food here or there or whatever, has what, some whatever struggles, but, but she's basically, you know, she's basically back to all raw. She, she totally gets that. So I really feel like it was mostly Harley to be like, and she was just kind of like, you know, yeah, but his photo, photo. <laughs> his, his, 
as far as I could see, his thing, Harley's thing was that he'd been supporting Doug, he'd been promoting Doug, he'd been trying to promote all that, and um, and I think he felt betrayed a little bit because I think he felt like Doug was involved in getting them. Yeah, he did. Their status removed from that festival or de- downgraded or I don't know. You know I don't feel that, like they thought that. I feel like they thought that he didn't go out of his way to defend them. Well, Even I, though they, they had obviously sold a lot of copies of the 801010 diet and promoted him so heavily, which they totally did. But then they just but then they just turned around and stabbed him in the back. Like, but I don't know <laughs> if if um I don't know if I'm always confused by this as to like who was it that brought up the idea, this idea that they should be removed from the festival or or not removed? But well, they weren't removed from the festival. They actually had nothing taken away from them other than the status of being a pioneer because they were breaking four of the 11 guidelines that you were supposed to yeah. follow to be but what, um, was there, the leader. Was there, they weren't representing the festival. So it, it, yeah. it made all the sense in the world that they couldn't be pioneers. But Otherwise, you, it, the whole thing was in hypocrisy. My, my feeling is there's when these things build like that and there's 500, 600 people and there might be more the next year and all that stuff, when things are building like that, that it's very easy for people, for jealousies to form and for people to start to think, for example, um, uh, well, you know, look, look at, uh, say with Durian, Ryder and Freely, and I think that they played a big role with their website and with their reach at the time in helping to fill that festival. I think they played the predominant part in that. Sure. Um, and and a few and a few other people did, but I, I really think the website that they had at the time was, was one of the main focal points. And therefore, they were getting uh, the attention, they were getting- They were getting paid the most money paid but not guaranteed money but through through selling tickets and things like that and they had their flights covered they had you know they, but every, everyone did though at that point like i didn't everyone didn't. But I, you know and most people were local to the state so it wasn't, t- tra- well, wasn't a lot of travel expenses anyway there's something mm-hmm. controversial so did you have your flights paid for when you came to uk fruit fest first time um i don't remember the first time but what i do remember is that you're a pretty generous guy ronnie and you like to share whatever there is around with people and i don't really keep track of that because i just i just trust your judgment and um always happy with the ethical moral kind of standards that you uphold but what i'm saying (laughs) is what i'm saying is i i think you did yeah there was a a payment made to food and sport which is what you were part of and part okay. of that was to cover flights, etc. And I don't know. I'm assuming that that was used. I don't like, mm. and I don't. I, mean, I, I don't understand why if Woodstock wouldn't have been set up the same. So I don't know. Like yeah, um, yeah. I think the thing. I, I think one thing with with that was that I was already going to the states prior to the Woodstock Fruit Festival for Doug's events each year to work at Doug's events and Doug was paying for my airfares for that. Um, so when the Woodstock Fruit Festival got added in, uh, I would have thought that a fair thing would be that they pay half and Doug pays half or something like that it would obviously make sense to me, right. but no, Mike, Mike Arnstein like decided that okay. Okay. Doug should keep paying for it, okay, um, which, I was, I thought, which I thought was a bit of a weird situation and it was always a bit of a, probably a sore point for Doug maybe as well. Yeah. So, um, but as, as far as I was aware at that time, a lot of the presenters were getting expenses and things. Maybe I'm wrong about that. They also had nice, the, the best rooms were going to presenters at one yeah, point. Yeah, for sure. And, and they were treated really well. I mean, a lot of these people had, maybe apart from Doug, but a lot of them wouldn't have really have been ever really been invited that much to, to many events. A lot of them really didn't have, and still don't, like a lot of them still haven't really built a great <laughs> following or reputation for themselves. Some of them have, but um, yep. but the thing is, when you when that's your one thing and your one place, and that's the place where you're on stage in front of tons of people, and 
you start to think, well, if that person wasn't here, I'd get more of a share of the life. <laughs> like, like there's certain people. Uh, yeah, that people definitely aware started of, picking them off for it sure. Became this, the wolves. The wolves came. A little came. bit of a power <laughs> thing of, and what's so dumb to me about that is like not realizing that without those people there isn't an audience <laughs> like, biting, you know? biting biting the hand that feeds basically <laughs> um and and uh but you know it's weird because you could i don't know i don't know exactly how much who was in mike's ear saying what we're going to do about harley and freely i don't know exactly if that was dawn or if it was doug or if it was if it was just the people who were attending the festival getting in touch with them, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know the sources of that, but it, it was like a pretty obvious time where something had to be done. Like everyone could see that something had to be done. That like Harley would like literally be making videos just before the festival showing him eating like three pizzas. cooked vegan pizzas, yeah. like on camera, like right there, like actually eating the whole thing, not just pretending like it I'm, he looked like. Yeah, I'm fairly sure Harley was, the first year I went, 2012, which was the second Woodstock, I'm pretty sure that even then he wasn't like yeah, doing he, it exactly yeah. anymore. I, For quite not, some number of years, he was drinking like pasteurized juice and kind of going down this marginal, like walking the, the tightrope of a little bit off raw, but not too far off. And, and so like, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ate kind of other things at that I, time. I, I just don't know. I had this weird moment with him the first time I met him at Woodstock. And uh, I was speaking with Harley and there was some kind of intuition in me, strangely enough, where I went, this guy's a sugar addict. I don't know why yeah. I thought that. Because <laughs> at that point, he, he was like 100% raw or whatever, or that was the impression. And... I just had this moment where I just felt like, because I'd been basically like a sugar junkie, like I used to binge on loads of sugar, um, which is totally different to eating a lot of fruit from my experience. Right? But I used to binge yeah. on refined sugar. Um, Stimulation over pleasure. It was, all, it was almost like I just felt like there was some kind of similar, like I could just see it in him. And then not that long after, he, he's sharing videos of pouring sugar into his smoothies and all that. So. It definitely made sense. It's, it's. I don't know exactly why they would have moved away from the raw diet. Maybe just the same as a lot of people. They experiment. They change. It's very convenient, uh, alluring to to just get a bigger audience, you know. And because um, to me, like you mentioned, how like you know they were raw, then they were cooked, and then whatever, and that's like, everything kept 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 kind of changing, right? The message yeah. kept changing, but it was always like. I've got to spread the message. Like you've got to hear my message. My message is so important. You know, listen to my message, and don't, just ignore the fact that the message keeps changing. Just listen to my message today. Like this is really important. Um, and I, I just feel like I, th I feel like he just it was just really convenient for him to branch out into the raw till four stuff and to start eating cooked and 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 expand into the cooked vegan um, market <laughs> space and. Uh, more so, not so not so much to make money, but just just to reach more people. Yeah. To feel like, and I really feel like it's about elevating status and feeling more important rather than actually, um, as much as it is helping people. You know. Yeah. I feel like yeah. I really feel like that was important to him. Like Stat the status thing is um, such a drive in human beings in general. I think that, and I think that's in a way that's why I think these events really worked and and being part of the community because you go to an event, you go, for me, going to Woodstock or whatever, and there's this hierarchy of, like, here's, here's you at the bottom, and, like, here's all these people, and, and you meet people who've got different levels of experience, and then there's these these people that have been doing it for many years and decades, and, and um, you know, you, you, you start to get motivated by that, that in itself. Yeah. Well, I feel like the, I feel like there is a hierarchy, but it, it just collapses at the festivals because it's just a perception that there's a hierarchy. Like really, we're just normal people. And, and that was like the whole problem with the, the concept of pioneers is, is that people that never went to the Woodstock Fruit Festival online, you know, keyboard warriors started feeling like there was some sort of elitism and that the, yeah, oh, the yeah. pioneers, they're so special and need all this special treatment and have us, you know, and the whole concept of pioneers was, was just, 
just putting names up like is like these are the people that you want to kind of pay attention to because they've been doing it for a long time that's there's no egos you know certainly not from my perspective i didn't really feel like anyone else there was like really hugely egocentric especially like certainly in the early days of woodstock i feel like everyone was just kind of there for all the right reasons and it was just a, a beautiful time to just share stuff with with others i mean there were there were some egos but you know it wasn't it wasn't overt <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of people that were quite young though as well, like a lot, a lot of the influencers and stuff. Um, it's not quite, even even if you say people in their twenties and stuff, it's still quite young, and and for them to be normal people the rest of the year, this this is the weird thing about that kind of festival is that they're normal people the rest of the year that no one knows, even if they are on YouTube virtually, they could they might get people come up to them now and again, but they're usually uh, anonymous and then to come to that and everyone wants to speak to them I know, and, yeah. and I, I think a lot of them didn't really handle it very well um i actually do think harley was one of the people that and freely did when she was there i do think they handled it pretty well harley i would say was had an infinite amount of patience for people as far as i could see like he was he really absolutely yeah asking questions about bicycles fitness you know diet whatever like he'd always have time to give an answer he'd always have time for a rant he'd always like for sure yeah so um where do we all want to go for this conversation I, I feel like at that point we know that there was a bit of a, a divide a bit of a split but woodstock kept going the various <clears throat> a bunch of the festivals kept going some of them after a few years uh, kind of stopped or slowed down um but where are we now with the raw vegan movement and how do we move forward and um, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is happening from your viewpoint? Well, it is an interesting time. Um, we have been kind of retrained into doing everything online because of this um, dollar-demic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an unknown. We don't know exactly where things are going forward from this. I, I, I still have hope that we're not going to be, um, you know, turned into robots and controlled. <laughs> um, so I, I still uh, I still think in-person festivals are, are the best support mechanism. I think that's fantastic. Um, I think this bundle, the ultimate raw vegan bundle, I've never seen anything like it in the in the fifteen years that I've been raw vegan. Um, I've seen bundles for for vegan stuff, and you know, but but like, why do why would I want to buy a bundle if there's like if I don't want like 80% of what's in it. This, um, this, this is the kind of thing I guess I'm talking about. When I feel like someone like Doug or Mike Arnstein or whatever, 10 years ago could have put something together like this. Theoretically could have yeah. been. Um, and, and these kind of things just didn't happen then. People, I remember being part of a meeting where Doug actually was talking at Woodstock to people about coming together helping each other out and it just fell apart the meeting was very strange you know and um yeah that that was but that was at a time where people in that meeting had already made up their mind that they were going to try to get Doug out of the festival and so they didn't come at that meeting with an open mind you know yeah like some people i, I can think of one person in spe specifically when they were asked to um comment they just said i have no comment like yeah, they literally, literally couldn't even say anything yeah i know exactly what you're talking about and, and i just think yeah, that, i know like, you do <laughs> <laughs> i just i just think that that um yeah people had turned against it but this is the this is the, the thing i feel is that this, this the conflict for me with doug is that if he wasn't such a uh, a person that was contrarian different prepared to go out on a limb if he wasn't that person he wouldn't have come up with this information and he wouldn't be doing what he's doing and he wouldn't have had the impact he's had but at the same time it also makes on the other side he has this personality that rubs people up the wrong way all the time <laughs> well it rubs people up that are easily triggered which is common to meet people like that when they're going through a healing crisis or right. like looking to improve their life, right? They're in vulnerable spaces. And so you can't really be short with them or abrupt with them. Um, 
you know, they really need those extra words to be nurturing and caring yeah. and show that you care and stuff in every conversation, which, <laughs> which is difficult to do when you're trying to speak to thousands of people at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, um, but even even like even like the different pioneers and things that were at that event, like a bunch of them turned against them in certain ways, and I don't know if they had personal experiences with them. I think that Doug's always he's a little bit competitive, or he's quite competitive, and I don't know if that came out like um, if that came out the wrong way. I I don't, I don't know exactly, but. Yeah, I mean, he's competitive with sport for sure. Um, he always like challenge. He, you know, he'll use competition to to make himself reach higher. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, he's certainly not competitive as in like trying to take your market share or something like that. You know, like like he's. I've never seen him behave like that. He he does. I mean, he's very sensitive. He does care a lot about people. Like he really, he really, he really does. Um, He's true to that, and and that's like even when people were attacking him, like Harley and and other people from Woodstock, um, attacking his character rather than actually using actual information because <laughs> they couldn't attack him any other way. Um, he held the high ground, like he he didn't um, he didn't fall into their low standard of, of of attack. He didn't attack their character. He could have buried them. He knew so, he knows things about all of those people. You know he knows all their dark dark secrets and and you know he's he's <laughs> he speaks to people too he knows all these things and um and a lot of it he knows firsthand but does he ever attack have you ever heard him attack no. anyone in person no ne like never never maybe one-on-one -on -one he might mention something if you really like you know really dig into him like like me i have a lot of trust with him so, and, and like i don't betray that trust so like we talk about things but um they're not things that i just then go and make a video about you know yeah he's told me he's told me things about people but probably six or seven years after getting to know yeah. him pretty well right like he's yeah. it's not like he came it's out safe yeah the safe first space. time i ever talked <laughs> but um you're right he's never publicly he never publicly says anything he doesn't really address but but i think people. i think that the i think he's never made if a there's, youtube if there's video, a fallacy like i think if there's a yeah he's never made a video attacking people like 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 everyone has about him like everyone on the kind of on, let's say on the dark side has about him. <laughs> um, might as well paint it black and white, right? Um, but like if there's to be a fallacy in the way he conducted himself, like in response to people attacking his character, you know, it, it, I, think, I think for people to, to trust you and, and get to know you, like you just have to be vulnerable and authentic and just share address the, the the elephant in the room and like like I feel like if he had been able to make videos at that time that were just genuine and authentic and not from a defensive place or, or whatever um, then I think that would have gone better for him but instead he chose to kind of just go silent which was the, the advice he was given by um, other people that were kind of trying to help him out at the time and, uh, and so he just went silent but then then he never got to Kind of tell his story and, and represent um, himself. Yeah, and that's, that's yeah, and, and, and he did make one response video, but it was like very late response. Like maybe it was like a month later because he was run. He started getting attacked, and then he was like in his busiest time of the year running his, his events in Cedro Woolley. Um, he didn't have time. He like literally didn't have time. You know, he's working like sixteen hours a day, and yeah. like he got to sleep. Sometimes he's getting like five or six hours sleep a night, and. He doesn't have time to have conversations with people outside those events at that time. So at the end of those events, he made a video in response to, to an attack like a month earlier. But he came at it from like a really defensive place. And that, if I had to watch that video before he released it, I would have said, don't release it. But, but I didn't get to see it until after it was released. And then I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Because so he, he was like saying, he was sort of giving being defend like justifying like oh i've been here working 16 hours a day and blah, 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 like and i couldn't do this and i couldn't so i haven't yeah. been able to respond yet and uh, he should have just come out and just address the issues like but you know, yeah, so, like, so, yeah it's easy to, with hindsight to, to say these things i know but that didn't yeah, happen it's so very, it's very hard to get those situations right you yeah. know and, and he was he was kind of at first he was going for the approach of saying nothing 
Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a situation at a fast that people don't know about. And, and a girl left the fast later on. She went to hospital and she's fully recovered. She's fine, but she maybe had a negative reaction. Whether that was anything to do with the fast is, is it's unclear, potentially unlikely that it was because she had other conditions coming into it. And I think she had, but anyway, um, don't need to go through all that. But the impact of all that has been, for example, that happened around the time the first UK Foot Fest was starting. And up to that point, everything seemed to be moving in the right direction. There was momentum behind it, a lot of people excited. And when that all happened, it felt like a little bit a bubble burst in the um, in the movement online a little bit. It was no longer unified under one movement, one banner kind of thing. And the Fruit Festival continued and has continued, and we've continued to uh, promote Doug and, um, and uh, all that stuff. And But it's I, I, I feel like it's been a bit of an uphill battle a little bit, and maybe it wouldn't have been so much before then. Um, yeah, I think not, if, not if one sure. thing at this, you know, the, the events that kind of went, the events that happened, like a, a, it highlighted what everyone's position, like, so the true believers, like yourself, myself, like we've been unwavering, like, and so it, it just became very clear, like who's really in this for the right reasons and who's not. And so it, that's good to know. But I feel like, um, you know, those times have passed I feel like the the wounds have healed. Those aren't really issues anymore. Most people don't even know what those videos are, um, yeah, or they're a distant memory. And so, like, I feel like there's a there's so many new people coming into this now for all the right reasons. And this bundle that we keep bringing back up again is just perfectly timely. Like, I feel like it's giving. I wish I had that when I started went raw in two thousand five. Like, um, it's just such an amazing resource, and to just have like contact with all of these people, um, yeah. like. It's literally like all of my six, like 60 of my best friends have all released all these products, most of them new for the bundle. And uh, that's the great thing that it is friends and we're having good fun with it. Yeah. And they're my friends for a reason because they're, they're true people. Like they, they're authentic. They, you know, they've got your back. They like, they don't, they don't like speak, <laughs> they don't attack your character, you know, yeah. they're like, so, they're doing it all for all the right reasons. And it's a beautiful thing. And as I, like it really endorsed like everyone in this bundle and and it's it's like you know yeah so let's let, it's, let's it's talk, really cool let, let's talk about the bundle a little bit i mean and you're saying when you started out when i started off there was definitely youtube so i definitely had that advantage there was the 30 banners a day website i had that advantage that a lot of people didn't have before me um there was doug's youtube channel which was there was and there was lectures from doug online so i i didn't have to travel to a, uh, a lecture somewhere um i was able to watch and there was the woodstock fruit festival and there was a bunch of other events and um but if i think about what i did to learn why did i go to woodstock why did i go to these places i was on a journey of learning so i think i bought the 80 10 10 diet i don't know what else i'd invested in but i bought my plane flight my ticket to woodstock that was about 800 pounds or something might have been a thousand 1200 dollars you probably invested in a peace love and seasonal fruit t-shirt five or six of those <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so like yeah i've got the entire chris kendall maybe, fashion ring. maybe even a raw aussie athlete t-shirt i'm not sure Def, I've, got, I've, def, I've definitely got one of those i've definitely got <laughs> one of those um yeah but i i went to was a, probably at least probably close to £2,000, $2,000 or something, maybe two, maybe $2,500, $3,000, just to go there at that point. And um, with all the other travel involved, hotels, etc. And then um, I, I think I went there, I think I got Tony Wright's book. I mean, I, I went to as many lectures as I could, but I went to Tony, I got Tony Wright's book, which is probably, who knows, $20, $30. I got uh, an audio program from Tim Van Orden. I got, um, I, 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 I don't, I can't remember exactly everything, but I got a bunch of stuff. And then I bought more of Doug's books online. I um, bought eBooks, recipe books, different stuff over the years and went to a massive amount of events. <laughs> you know, then went to 
went to Thailand to hang out with people, went to the Danish festival, the Spanish festival, the Slovenian festival, all to continue to learn and really get this. And um, I have no doubt that if I had been offered this bundle at that point, if free of durian rider or 30 bananas a day had organized the bundle at that point that um no doubt i would have i would have got it and it would have really I, you know there's mistakes that i made with this lifestyle that definitely cost me as well especially with my teeth I, I did damage to my teeth because of um doing things the wrong way and so did i and that could I, and i could have saved a lot of not just money, but the, the, you know, the, the pain and whatever, and the time of going to a dentist and all that stuff because of my poor advice that I'd found where, for example, a bundle like this might have had stuff in it that would have given me the right advice. So this kind of education, this kind of knowledge is, the, the value in it is a no brainer because it is so cheap for so many books and things. Um, and I've been enjoying, I've been learning stuff, going through this stuff already. I've been looking through it and your book, tell, tell us a bit about your book. Uh, what's the idea behind that? It's a really funny idea, but. Yeah, everyone, satisfying, satisfying hotel salads. So it's, everyone, it's about making, you know, making salads with, uh, with basically no tools in a hotel room. And uh, that's what I'm doing here in a hotel room in, in Mexico. And um, so I just, I just made whatever salad I made each night for 30 days photographed it, wrote up the ingredients and some basic directions, just like, you know, whether to grate something or peel something or whatever. And, um, and that was the book and it's, and it's, it's great. And Nate made, made one of the recipes the other day on his, on his, on his tailgate of his truck. <laughs> and that, that speaks volumes about how simple, you know, you just need a chop, basically need, you just need a cutting board, a knife, yeah. Um, you know, and, and you can literally make this stuff with no tools, you know, if you've got a clean surface to make it on. Um, it, it's just so simple, you know, and um, chop up some tomatoes and <laughs> some zucchini and maybe, make, and I, I bought a grater. I love, I love using a, a vegetable grater to, to, to just shred the, to grate up um, zucchini and just make really quick kind of shoestring noodles. Uh, super fast, super easy, tastes great, has a great texture and mouthfeel. You know, throw some avocado and some um, cilantro or coriander if you're from Australia in there. And um, I've been using some spice mix, like um, there's a great curry mix here that's just basically it's um, turmeric, cumin and, and, um, and, uh, and coriander seed. And, yeah, um, but I, I wouldn't, I, the, you're, you've got some styles that like, I, I, it's weird because I know that coriander or cilantro is a green. I get that, but it's really like a herb, is it not? You don't do you eat it in the quantities for it to be like lettuce? Like, is it not kind of, <laughs> is it not kind of inedible to eat it in that, like in massive bunches, or is it? I don't. I've never well, really I mean, I'm having much. like they have really big bunches of of cilantro here in in Mexico, um, yeah. where I am. Like they're they're big bunches, maybe like double. Or, or even possibly triple the size of a bunch in Australia, probably double. And and I you know I've put in up to three bunches. Three bunches starts to get a little because it gets drier the more you add, right? Um, but if I've um, you know if I like really stir it up and 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 mix the tomatoes through so the juices and if I use cucumber instead of zucchini, it gets a little bit wetter. Um, and then throw a bit of avocado in there and, and like a really soft, very ripe avocado that's really a creamy type. Like the local avocados here are less fatty than Hass avocados and bigger, but they're um, really super creamy and they're perfect for like just stirring through a salad and just, it just helps the greens to kind of stick to everything else. And then if you want to add some, um, you know, if you're worried about getting iron or something like that, you can just add some some citrus juice to it, like whether it's lemon, lime, or, or even orange juice, just squeeze a little bit of that on, on the greens and you can absorb twice as much iron. Um, but I don't even bother with that most of the time. <laughs> I just make it tasty and, and I eat, a large volume have a pretty pretty big bowl and uh, and I usually fill it up. <laughs> and um, how big's the bowl? How big is the bowl? Oh, oh, by the oh, way, I can, you had, I can you had show a, you. there's a recipe in your book. I think it says three avocados. That's that's big. Um, <laughs> is that right? I think I, I think that did happen. Like I said, you know, it was it was just brutally honest what I what I ate for a month and um, and. Um, 
Yeah, the bowl, the bowl is like, you know. Oh, that's not too big, yeah. Not crazy, yeah. But, uh, you know, got some uh, little, some black sapotes and some mame and tomatoes, avocado, bananas, zucchini. Oh, and, uh, and I found out all about these local things. They, they're called elephant garlic. They're not actually garlic. They're more like leek. Um, they call it elephant garlic. That's quite nice too. Doesn't doesn't like make you have garlic breath or anything like yeah. that. So it has so, a nice flavour. So your book is part of the bundle, um, the the dirty salads, which is a, a really fun book. I I, I like it. Um, we've got Melissa. Now Melissa has her book. I think she's got a journaling course or a yes. journaling program, and she's got the burger book, and. I think there's two journaling books there. Right. Yeah. And um, she's, her books have got really high praise and esteem over the years. She could have just released her own book without this bundle being part of it and, and of course, been really absolutely. successful with that. But she's, her and Chris, and Chris could have done the same, but they've get, offered this opportunity to everyone to help promote this and, and everyone's benefiting from it. So that's really cool and really uh, nice to be part of. And as, as someone that's always with working on events, has been working on trying to bring people together and offer people opportunities and things like that, it's, uh, it's, ni it's nice to be on the other side of that. You know, it's nice to be on the receiving end, I suppose, or the end of that, that that's um, the easier side, I suppose. Um, but they, had, they have such a great reputation and, and audience. They didn't really need to do this uh, for themselves, really, but her, her books i've seen her books personally people buy buy them for 35 pounds for each book at uk fruit fest i've seen that many times i've seen her own books on amazon and the price of the entire bundle is the same as yeah. one of her books the same it's with, incredible yeah the same with chris i i bought chris's pizza book a number of years ago i think i think it was 20 pounds or 20 dollars whatever it was and his new book, the Spring Meal Plan, is part of this. And once again, it's uh, just one book would have, or a bundle of his books would be more than uh, this whole thing. Yeah, and um, yours is of substantial value too. I mean, yours, your book has so much information in it. It's crazy. Like, and that's just one out of 65 books. It's like, it's impressive. And I, I really feel like this is a catalyst. Like, I feel like this, this to me feels like the same as the first year of the Woodstock Fruit Festival. Like Mike Arnstein had this idea and I, I remember being at a, a dinner at Doug's events where Mike said, Doug, I want to create this event in your honor and then blah, blah. And then, and then he made it happen. And, and what happened, it, it, it got all the influences together. And instead of everyone sure. being on their own solo journey, promoting themselves as a struggle and competing against everybody else, it brought everyone together and all these collaborations happened and, and it was yeah. amazing. And so many collaborations happened from those first years of Woodstock Fruit Festival. And that just continued and well, but even, it, it didn't yeah. really happen before then. And, and now I see this as the same sort of thing. It's like, okay, yes, this, this is great. It's bringing all this information to people that need it, um, that are going to benefit from it. And it's cheap and it's, it's like, it's got something for everybody. Like there's just so much information in there. It's whatever you want to read, it's there somewhere. And, um, but, uh, but more importantly, I feel like it's bringing all of us together, the contributors to the bundle. You know, we're having our fun in the chat sessions back, you know, behind the scenes, but it's bringing us together and connecting us and, 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 and making it really clear, just reinforcing that message again, that, that like by working together as a synergy, we're all on the same, we're all on the same team, you know, we can lift the movement and, and help save, you know, the raw vegan movement. Um, yeah. Not that I think we're saving it at this point, but I'd like certainly growing it. And I um, think we're all, we're learning from each other where they're setting a great example um obviously i mean everyone's benefiting from it and for everyone like for promoting the bundle i've uh, i get money back from it i'm essentially putting that into helping with the festival and stuff like that that's what i intend to do with it and there's expenses still from even last year's festival that need to be covered and things like that so it's a it's, it's a great opportunity for um, people to support the festival as well back in return but um yeah I, I i think that what they're doing is a great thing 
the people that are part of it, as you say, people are coming together. And I think that this will this will be a catalyst for a lot of a lot of people saying, well, we could do other things. You know, maybe not the same because this is their thing, but there's other things that we can do. Yeah, even just cross promoting your own products, like why not? Like people have always kind of felt awkward about that, I think, but like now this is highlighting how important it is to like just support each other without any expectations, not like what's in it for me, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. If I if I did this interview with you now and, and it results in you know helping the UK Fruit Festival, that's an, that's all I need from it. Like that's that's beautiful, you know. <laughs> well the great the great thing about these things is we put them online, we just don't know where it's gonna go or in a couple of years time someone could watch it and get something from it is because we're really sharing universal truths <laughs> you know that aren't going to sure. change um I, I i and as you say we're kind of like and a lot of people even watching this right now we're all kind of super committed people to this we're just at this point we uh, are maybe not as voracious consumers of, the, of content or or educational materials although we still have a lot to learn but um, we still like getting together. We still want to be around each other. We still want to learn. And I guess our position now is, I think you go from being your the apprentice, you're learning, uh, you're just a complete beginner learning. You eventually become sort of an apprentice in some way or whatever. You start to understand it a bit more. You start to help others, and then you become more of a more of a, a, a leader to other people or or people look up to you or whatever and then you maybe keep on going up and I think that's important I think people should keep going up like I don't think um I think it would be bad for me if I just keep the UK Fruit Fest as like 100 people coming every year and that's all I did you know I think I should try and help other people do events or you know like it should keep on yeah. going up like that not just Absolutely. like because and, you know, we other talked... people want to come in and do the smaller events, you know, and they should have a space to do that. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, we talked a lot about Doug, and I and I just feel like it's worth noting that he has always been a springboard for other people to to become. You know, like you look at any like any of the leaders, like from like five or ten years ago, like they all had something to do with Doug Graham in this movement. Like they. They all used him as a springboard in some way and and you know he has the humility you know, he's quite humble in that regard like he he always he always saw the value in mentoring people and and in fact this year in costa rica he didn't even run a fast he he just ran an internship program because he just loves it like it, it's he's really good at it people get so much out of it and and it's, and it's he just really gets a kick out of um seeing people grow and and you know, do their own thing in the world and, and succeed at it for like, you know, helping to grow the movement and just being good people doing, you know, helping to grow the aspects of the community that we all love and thrive on. Well, there's something really special about being around people that are eating fruit together. And I think that's always going to pull us together. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I always have 100% positive feelings about everyone that I've met in this community or in this movement. But in reality, even the people that I've had the most arguments with or little debates with or whatever, when I see them, I'm really happy to see them. Like, I really want them to do well. Like, I yeah, want yeah, them for sure. and I want to eat with them and share, you know, some of them that move away from eating fruit, it becomes difficult to share that with them. But like i think it's the most natural thing for for people to be and something else i think about saving this movement i think the festivals and the events are going beyond they automatically go beyond it's just about learning about raw food they become incredibly special experiences for people one-off experiences almost like a homecoming to a family that they've never had and a community that they've they didn't grow up in but they almost feel by the end of the week that they're completely part of it and accepted into it yeah, and they're you understood made, you made an important point people come in thinking there's a hierarchy and there really isn't and in some ways maybe you could even make an argument maybe there should be maybe it'd be a good thing if there was more of a, a structure i don't know but and, and to some degree there should be leadership 
and oh no, definitely there should be leadership, but there's not leadership in the sense of well, you can't speak to this person yet, or or <laughs> or you yeah. don't get to be part of that, or like it's it's um, role models don't have to be in a hierarchy. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm thinking like what's the perfect human experience? Like, you know, the way that they, in lab laboratories, I don't know if you've heard this thing, like, so I've, we've probably talked about this, but mice will get, if you give put mice in a cage and they've got sugar, water, or they've got water in cocaine, the mice will eventually get addicted to the cocaine and, or, or, say cocaine versus food, they'll eventually starve themselves to death because they keep on going back to the cocaine because they get addicted, right? And the addiction is so strong. But that was because, but that was in a cage. What they started to do was, instead of putting them in a cage, they put them in this perfect environment for mice, like runs, little holes, little like climbing frame, whatever, all this stuff that's really super stimulating for mice. And all of a sudden the mice didn't get addicted to cocaine anymore. You know, they didn't kill themselves with starvation. Oh, and so, so the, the same food and cocaine was available, but they had somewhere to play. They had an environment that was stimulating that was that met their needs. Yeah. And and this is something that I've really felt when I came to this lifestyle was this change of of like the desire, yeah, you get a desire to be in a more natural environment and, and, and that's not exactly the easiest thing to do sometimes, but just, I've had times where I've been climbing trees, I've had times in forests and I just think there's something about this, if we could replicate this as well, this experience, this feeling, if we could, ha if we could have a play park kind of thing, but with like trees for climbing and and different stuff like that and we we could have like the fruit um somewhere and we all go for a, like on a voyage to all get this fruit together or something i don't know like this there's different like fun ideas that could be that could be created you know um that i think would replicate mm. some some kind of common understanding and feeling that we have you know on some level yeah, I think um, part of it is that uh, being with like-minded people, you you let your guard down, you're relaxed, you can just you feel safe being your authentic self. You're not trying to hide anything, so that that feels very pleasant when a lot of us you know come from worlds where that isn't really an option. You know, day to day because you know there's judgments and and restrictions and limitations, um, un unaccepted behaviors or whatever it is. <laughs> unsupporting environments so um yeah i mean i think we live in that world already ronnie there's trees everywhere there's you know it's just a matter of us getting together and and playing <laughs> yeah yeah um I'll, I'll, just before we finish i think we'll maybe bring it to a close soon um but just one more thing about the bundle you've got your book nate has a book called dude food i think it's nice creams books part of it as well so he's got two books yes. one nice cream which is ice cream made out of fruit essentially but it's way more than just that um <laughs> oh, it's Alyssa's best. books chris's books this is a it's like a lifetime of recipes as you're saying um we got the rick and Karen and dina i think their product is more of a mindset thing which is very interesting yeah benjamin yeah. benoulis has a tapping course which i loved i went through the course um Rosie Heels or Kelsey, she has a course called Eat Fruit Live Slow. That's like eight or nine videos, really well made, super, superbly made. Um, you've got Karen Ramsey's Hormone Boost Plan. Lexi Tavares has a fruit uh, fruit book. I can't remember the exact name. Mm -hmm. um, and we can go on and on. Uh, Don Bennett's books in it. Q and A with Don Excellent Bennett. Q and A, yeah, yeah, yeah um your book of course um, my book the, the there's the lifestyle. nut there's that nut free book by that's John a great Kosak. one yeah. yeah that i remember that coming out years ago that's yeah, a remember. great book yeah. nuts about no nuts where there's no nuts that's that was such a smart you know this these books are so smart like people figure out what people are 
interested in like here's a recipe a raw food recipe but with no nuts whatsoever like that was a brilliant yeah. idea well here's recipes you can make in a hotel room <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um so uh, yeah the same and then and then there's um doug's wife rosie rosalind graham she she wrote a book called um creating uh, what's it called creating creating dietary peace through peace. diet creating dietary peace yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to read that. I haven't, haven't started it yet, but I'm, that's, that's something I'm excited to, to, to jump into myself. Like it's a brand new book. She's never written an ebook before. So, and she created that just for this bundle, like so yeah, many of us did. And there's a bunch of people I don't know yet that I've never really connected with before, but I'm, I'm excited to see more people and uh, yeah, I'm excited to see how that all goes and, and, and figure all that. So we'll put some links down below if anyone wants to go and uh, learn more about it and it's only going to be available for the next few days it finishes on the 11th at 12 p.m pst so that's very early in the morning uk time on sunday so you probably want to go and get that on saturday to make sure you get it and um fully support it i don't think you'll regret it i don't think you'll have any feeling of being um uh would you call it buyer's remorse because i think you're gonna realize there's way more in it than you even realize so really cool product really cool bundle it's been nice mm -hmm. to get together with people and i want to i'll be doing more lives and stuff over the next few days grant review are you doing more stuff over the next few days I'm trying to uh, get I, this I don't have anything specific planned but uh, I, I probably will go live on youtube or something yeah cool Cool. Because I can do that uh, solo, but I just can't seem to invite people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, where, um, what, 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 what do you think? I mean, I, I think I do think the movement kind of needs leaders. It needs leadership. I think at one point, Mike Arnstein was a big point of that, and Durian Ryder and Freely, and and they've all kind of disappeared. And Doug, to some extent, was thrust to that position but wasn't necessarily trying to be that um but he does he does see himself as a leader for sure uh but he's not like he's not i don't think he's in a stage of his life where he's desperate to prove himself or anything anymore i'm not sure but um i mean if 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 i i don't i, I don't mind if people want to um get behind melissa get behind chris whoever wants to Whoever wants to take this movement to the next level, I'm I'm happy to support. Basically, yeah, I, I would love. We kind of touched on debates and how good Doug is at debates. I, I'm still for years now. I've been just waiting for the deb debates, the raw vegan debates, to happen because it, you know, like you saw it happen in the vegan movement with vegan gains and and you know um, maybe Isaac, like the uh, Ask Yourself and those kind of guys. Um, they had great discussions, but it wasn't about raw. <laughs> I'd just love to see the debates happen for the raw veganism, just from totally honest, no egos, just get the right people on, have the discussions from polar, you know, opposite viewpoints or whatever, and just hash it out. It'd be amazing. I'd love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know who's going to make that happen, but um, I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I see I that mean, as, as a way forward for sure. I mean, it'd be nice if there's a few, I mean, there's some obvious, I think you, for a debate, you need to have people that are equally kind of strong in what they're saying. And so the obvious one to me is like Doug and maybe Brian Clement or something like that, because they could actually have a decent debate. I don't think Brian has a, a great point or a great position of saying- uh, Brian could never win that debate. So yeah, it wouldn't be a fair debate. I, I, but he, He's, I've seen him in, in his confidence. Videos. He will for sure. take on the, like, he will keep it going. He will definitely. <laughs> It'll be a good debate, but it won't be pretty, won't be pretty for him. And then this, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. Um, but I would just like to see like, 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 like Mike the Vegan, you know, he's so cool, but he has a, like a, a pretty like anti-fruit consumption kind of thing. Like he's not against fruit altogether, but he's like, too much fruit, no, that's too much fruit, too much sugar, too much. And I think like, wow, for someone that's so much into the science and makes such great arguments, <clears throat> I feel like he, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like he just 
hasn't really heard our viewpoints, you know, clearly. And, I, and I'd, I'd love to see people like him have debates with Doug or Rick and Karen or like, or whatever, I don't know, like get vegan games, get, get like, get all I, these. I honestly think people get very uncomfortable around the raw food message because I think that people on some level go, this makes sense. And they're kind of not happy about the fact that they know it makes sense. It's like, yeah, because I just when, don't think anyone's approached them, you know? Yeah, because I, I don't think like, any of us have approached them to do that, to have those take, debates. You take the, because what, what people want to take you, it's like with any kind of fight or any kind of war or any kind of thing, what people really want is to take you into their domain and bring you down to their level or take you to their area of competence and beat you at what they're good at, right? So, so we'll, well, yes. changing the rules. So, in the case of this kind of discussion on raw veganism or or not raw veganism what people want to take you into is the world of nutrition science let's break everything down into how much of this nutrient how much of that nutrient how much of the rest right and that's one way of looking at things but we could look at it from the the way that a lot of raw vegans look at it which is but it's kind of obvious that when you cook food, you damage it, and every single animal on the planet eats a raw food diet. <laughs> right? yeah. So it must make it must, well, logically, it must make sense that human beings must have a raw food diet that we equally thrive on, and it must be the best diet because it's a diet because cooking the food damages it in some way. So how can we not, you know, like when you look at it on that simplified level? So sure, there's no argument against that, but but. I think um, I think it's actually cool with this all this online stuff, like because you can actually mute people now. So I, I'd love to see debates where there's a moderator that can mute any speaker if they're being arrogant, um, you know, just dominating. <clears throat> if they're attacking character rather than presenting good arguments, the moderator just mutes them. The moderator makes uh, you know says something uh, about why they why the person got muted, and and then the discussion continues, um, and 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 you can moderate the time that someone speaks for like you know in, in live debates in person i saw you know doug and brian clement and, and and people debating and and people the people that speak the loudest and they take all this extra time and they talk 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 they go over time the the the, the bell rings the moderator tries to silence them they just get louder and just keep talking um you know things like that you can actually control those things like that when it's online so i think it could be really healthy debates and um and keep you could even have people with big egos on there and, and just keep them at bay by <laughs> by moderating them and and they either stick to it or they or they don't get to speak like simple as that sure sure okay well we'll probably bring this to a close it's been really fun and any comments or questions simon said does the fruit and the lifestyle in the festival help you become authentic or is this due to upbringing um i think that from my the way i look at that question is that it's a perfect synergy of i don't know I, I feel like this this lifestyle is aligned with people who are very honestly seeking the truth in life like something better like are are, are open to giving up all the previous ideas questioning their ideas giving up sacrificing the things of the past to seek something better in life and seek something honest and real and true and that attracts people to this as far as i can see and therefore but does would you get an inauthentic person getting them eating fruit and they would change i don't know exactly if that's going to happen you know but i think an inauthentic person is not going to be able to stick with this diet because they'll they're the eat they'll they'll find it easy to find excuses for not to do it if you're not being fully honest with yourself or fully honest with other people you're probably not being fully honest with yourself and therefore you're you find it easier maybe to live a a lie i don't know maybe that's a bit of a heavy way of putting it but i think that yeah i, I would i would say like you know when people are in unsupportive environments uh, um and we all grew up in some form of an unsupportive environment uh, you know it's general to generalize um, so we develop coping mechanisms or protective mechanisms. And I feel like <clears throat> those are the things, those are the reasons that we're not truly authentic. So um, becoming authentic is about removing those layers, those protective layers, those coping mechanisms, and just being our true selves that, that's always been there since we were born um, and, 
and just re rediscovering that. And I, and I feel like fruit and lifestyle, fruit and a healthy lifestyle is a catalyst for that. It's not a panacea. It's not a guarantee. Like it's not the only factor. Like there's other factors. You still need to be in a supportive environment in order to, you know, be thriving and to, to peel away these layers and to grow and, and to just be your true um, authentic self and to develop the confidence in doing that. Uh, but certainly without fruit and lifestyle, it, it's a lot harder. Yeah. Um, any, any last thoughts before we leave tonight? Uh, you're welcome, Simon. <laughs> um, last thoughts. I don't know. It's, uh, I've really enjoyed the, the conversation. We touched on some pretty, pretty heavy, heavy topics and, uh, hope uh, people enjoy, enjoy listening back. And, uh, I really do see this, this bundle as, as the, you know, the current kind of injection into the raw vegan movement. It's really a significant thing. Like it's, it's really significant from, uh, from the perspective of the, the, the collaborations between we're definitely going to have yeah, leaders and the new generation coming through and, yeah. and also just helping people to live the lifestyle more successfully. So you get less dropouts and people actually get to stick to it and get the benefits they're all seeking. I think we're definitely going to have conversations with people in two, three, five, ten 10 years time where they'll say, you know, when I, I got into this lifestyle, cause I got this, the ultimate raw vegan bundle and, you know, I read your book, Grant. I, I made the hotel salads. Like, we're going to have those conversations with people that this was their first, as you're saying, like their first little step forward into all this. And uh, that's really great. That's really yeah. cool. And, and because, you know, one of the things I love about the UK Fruit Festival, I've told you this many times, Ronnie, is because you run it and, and you come at you, and because all the decisions are made for the right reasons. There's no like ulterior motives. You're not, you're not doing it to make money. Obviously you're trying not to lose money, but, but you're just doing it for all the right reasons for the greater good. And, and, you know, Melissa and Chris, um, behind this bundle, they're the same. Like to me, they, they don't, I've never seen them with ulterior motives. They, you know, they'd rather, um, have integrity than money, but you know, they, they make a living from it and that's great, but they never do it by compromising their integrity or taking advantage of others or anything. So just the fact that they're so authentic um, in bringing this bundle to people, like it really truly delivers value. And, and um, you know, I'm just excited about that because to me, that's something that's sustainable, something that's gonna grow and something that everybody can resonate with that honesty, that deeper meaning. And, and you don't get all, you know, I don't, you know, I don't see all the um, kind of animosity and turmoil that came out of other initiatives that weren't from such a pure heart. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for watching and listening. Please put some comments below and let us know. Would you like to see more conversations like this, more frank, you know, authentic, honest? I mean, I don't know what the words are, but behind the scenes, like whatever you want to call it, like we could go into more detail into st stuff, but who knows um, if, if that's interesting to people. But we could talk about all sorts of stuff, that, that putting on events and putting together books and, and whatever, the, the, the stuff that might be interesting to people, the personal tales, people that we've met, inspiration and all that stuff. So um, let us know below if this is something that you'd like to see more regularly. Um, if you'd Frank, like to Frank see Campbell the, and Frankie Smith. Yeah, <laughs> if you'd like to see the uh, debates, put some information down below. It'd be interesting to know what debates people would want. I think, um, I mean, Protein. debates within the community, debates outside. So it would be, yeah, for sure, it'd be good to see a debate with someone that's a carnivore. It would be interesting to see someone like Doug or Rick and Karen or even you. Well, no, I, don't say, I don't say even you. I think that you'd be perfectly as competent as any of them to, to, to talk about that. Um, debates with, against, um, like debates, not against, but debates with ex-vegans, um, debates with ex raw yeah. vegans, debates you know, whatever, like debates with, I don't know, just, just, just hearing honest positions from people about what they're, what they believe and why, and, and just have the discussion. Yeah. And there can, there can be, the thing is there, there can be like debates about high fat and low fat, but I get the feeling that debate would be like, like, well, I just feel better like this. You know, I think there's a lot of people that don't, they don't really have a debate. They, they, they just have their personal thing that they want to do. So they, they're not really looking to force it on anyone else. Um, and yeah. fruitarianism versus non, like versus including 
vegetables and other things might be interesting. I mean, you can go with very object objective topics like nutrition and, and whatever, or you can go with subjective things like sense of well-being. Sure. Which doesn't have to be completely subjective, but um, we could get you know, or, or maybe. world peace, like what which diet is going to like create more peace in the world, or or you can oh. have ethical 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 discussions would be great too. Like so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and but like an environmental discussion about environmental, hundred percent. Yeah, because because what it could be is you could come up with say ten debate ideas, and then try and find the people that would fit in with those topics. So you could do um, vegan versus non-vegan, right? So you could get someone to talk about that. You could raw versus non-raw. You could get people that fit in with that. You could supplements versus non-supplements um exercise versus limited exercise or whatever you could be you get, could be good for that <laughs> get the flu versus not get the flu vaccines yeah so there could be a whole program carnivore versus raw vegan or vegetarian or whatever as you're saying some sure. next I, I, I would participate in that that would be fun juice fasting <laughs> versus non-juicing so yeah this yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and yeah, and I think they all should be like, you know, nothing should be aggressive or or like it's not so and so versus so and so or against so and so. Like I, I think it just should be like just having a debate about this is the topic. And uh yeah, I think a moderator is important and just be I think it'd just be great. I think people would be really interested to hear the where, where it goes like if you get you know if you just get the, the right people on each side to have that interesting debate where where no side is like weak or strong or like weak or, or super like so much stronger like it you know where they just get to have a genuine genuine discussion about it and people make their own decisions about it you can maybe you can maybe do like some people could donate and there could be money going to like a charitable cause or something or there could be some like good thing so like well. so like fruitarian versus carnivore like fruitarian like debating a carnivore like do you donate to like meat.org or 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 fruit.org like how well, do you... <laughs> maybe it would be well I, I i always like the idea of like um kind of wildlife like so chimpanzees gorillas i don't but i don't know like i don't know if these foundations are are all good i don't know like yeah. I hope they I kind of hope they are. Maybe the money's all going to the black. Maybe somewhere. maybe you could get the speakers to agree on a on a on a donation um on a on a charity before beforehand. Yeah. It absolutely. might be hard to find a common <laughs> in some of the discussions. Yeah. Okay, well thanks, Grant. I think we'll maybe leave it for tonight. Um been really nice to talk to you. Um, Always a pleasure. And this will be going up everywhere. So everyone check the links below for the bundle and uh, let us give us some feedback and we'll see you in another video thanks ronnie